today is going to be something of an introduction. Um, you know, Lord's Supper is uh, Sunday, and you can go a little longer. And so, um, so today we're just going to going to get started, kind of scratch the surface. Um, but when we think about our adult Sunday school class, we like to rotate things that we, we do between, for example, more you know, Bible books, kind of surveys of the Bible, which we've had for the last while. Uh, so studies on history, um, kind of more practical things, uh, which, which this would fall under the, the category of um, learning how to, to live out our faith, we might say. So this class would fall under the, the practical, kind of living out our faith type of category. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this book. Um, I'm going to teach us through this book called Surviving Religion 101, uh, subtitle Letters to a Christian Student on Keeping the Faith in College by Dr. Michael Kruger, uh, published by Crossway, uh, four or five years ago probably. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of background on the book, and then we will... Um, We'll dive in. We're not, we're not actually really get, going to get into the book a whole lot today. Well, next next Sunday at Sunday school, we're really going to get into the meat of the book. Um, but just again, today is something of an introduction. Um, so let me just introduce Dr. Kruger in, in this book. If you want to buy it? Uh, it's not very expensive, um, but I'm going to cover what he covers fairly fairly thoroughly. And so you'll get most of what's in here um, in the Sunday school class, and I'll do things a little bit differently as well. Different verses, etc. Um, but Dr. Kruger, and Dr. Mike Kruger, uh, was one of my professors uh, at RTS Charlotte. Um, when I was um, director of the Houston campus, he was more of a colleague, um, friend. But more importantly for this course, uh, he is a New Testament scholar. He's a professor of New Testament at Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte. Uh, several chapters in here have to do with um, um, have to do with issues in the Bible. Does the Bible contradict itself? You know, the Bible was written so long ago. How do we know it's true? Um, Dr. Kruger is one of the world's leading textual scholars, textual criticism, looking at old, ancient manuscripts, uh, et, cetera, et cetera. That's his area of kind of academic expertise. Uh, but he also taught my apologetics class. So I had Dr. Kruger for apologetics. And that's going to be a little bit about what we're doing of the next few weeks, kind of an apologetics class um, answering some of the main objections that we hear to the Christian faith in the world around us. In fact, the subtitle is Letters to a Christian Student on Keeping the Faith in College. So if you read this book, the introduction, uh, Dr. Kruger gives a little bit of the background as to why he wrote. So let me just give a little bit about why the genesis of this book. Um, when he uh, was an undergrad at University of North Carolina, uh, he had uh, a religion class with a very notable, famous New Testament scholar who is what we call a critical scholar, um, doesn't believe the Bible is inspired at all, uh, named Bart Ehrman. Has anyone heard the name Bart Ehrman? You wouldn't heard the name Bart Ehrman. Okay. Bart Ehrman is, um, is a professor at UNC, um, critical scholar, and meaning he, you know, he's rejected um, the inspiration of Scripture, rejected the supernatural in Scripture, the resurrection, etc. And, and, his, and, and when, when Bart Ehrman teaches the Religion 101 class, which is why he titled it Surviving Religion 101, um, many an evangelical young person, their faith has been rocked, destroyed. Because they go from you know, their church environment, um, maybe never hearing some of these objections and biblical answers to these objections. And they go and they sit in this class with hundreds of people and a guy with a lot of degrees, a lot of letters next to his name. You know, starts kind of railing against the Bible, against Christianity. Isn't the Bible just a human document? You know, there's all kind of errors in the Bible. Um, uh, you know, no one really believes that stuff anymore, and their faith gets shaken. And Dr. Kruger, you know, had Dr. Ehrman, had Bart Ehrman, um, graduated 
went off to do his graduate studies and is now a professor. But Dr. Kruger has written many a book kind of challenging Bart Ehrman's critical works. And this is one of them. So the book is written in letters. So his daughter, uh, one of his daughters went to UNC two years ago, he was a freshman there. And so the book is written as if he is writing letters to his daughter um, answering all the questions, many of the questions, that she will face on a college campus. So why it's good for us is the questions that you face on a college campus are questions that we face all the time. And they're not limited to the university campus. Um, we hear them all over the news, the radio, books we read. It's the air of the culture in which we live. And so I think it would be helpful for us as a church and as Christians who desire to be salt and light in this world to have uh, to have some tools in our toolbox as we seek to talk to our neighbors, um, our co-workers, who are skeptics, um, you know, skeptical of the Christian faith, have genuine questions. We need to know how to respond and how to answer those questions in truth and in love. And so that's that's kind of the genesis of the book, and this will be our our main text over the next over the next few weeks. So, the book is about answering challenges to God's word. Let me ask you a question as we get started. This is all under point number one, uh, introduction on the handout. Did challenges to God's word just begin, you know, just a few generations ago on the college campus? How long has the church been dealing with challenges to God's word? Where, where did the where did the challenge to God's word begin? From the beginning. What do you mean that from the what do you mean from the beginning? Well, you could go back to Genesis one one, but but the church has faced it ever since Pentecost. Ever since Pentecost, yeah, yeah. So you read the book of Acts, for example, Peter and Paul, they're facing objections. The Sadducees, for example, they rejected the they rejected the resurrection of Christ. Um, Paul, uh, we'll we'll look at Paul in Athens a little bit later this morning, hopefully. Uh, Paul was dealing with Stoic and Epicurean philosophers. Absolutely. Yes, Brad, you have a thought? Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. Said, yeah. As God said. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. So, I mean, the first skeptic, in quotes, was Satan himself. Now, did God really say, and did, did God really you know, say, Eve, that you can't eat in any garden, or any uh, fruit of the garden, or even touch it? Um, and then Satan ups his game a little bit, and then um, it's a, 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 not a lot. You know, you will not die. You will not die. So there in the garden, you have two opposing words: the word of God and the word of the serpent. And whose word? To whose word will we submit? Will we submit to God's word, which has been inscripturated in the Bible, or will we submit to the word of the world? The world of Satan, the world of self, those are all kind of under the same, under the same broad heading. So all the way back in the garden is where challenges to God's word um, began. But if we fast forward you know, throughout church history, in around the 1700s, so just the elements of kind of history of thought, around the 1700s there was a massive, significant intellectual shift in the West. We're dealing with the West primarily here. Um, if you are familiar with what that massive intellectual shift was around and about 1700, the 1700s and what it, what, it, what it had to do with? We, the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment. Who in here are the Enlightenment? Who in here are Rene Descartes, Emmanuel Kant, all those guys. Um, Rousseau. Hangel, Rousseau, all those philosophers you might have learned about in high school or college. Um, R.C. Sproul wrote a book one time called Ideas Have Consequences. So, for example, Immanuel Kant, his, he was a professor in the 1700s in Germany. He had a really boring life. He didn't really do anything but walk to his office, write books, and walk back home. Then he died. That was his life. But his pen, his pen and his ideas have impacted your life and my life and the life of the West in ways that you cannot even imagine. I mean, we are all living in a post-Kantian kind of world, an Enlightenment kind of world. So 
What happened in life, and Reed, you know, what, what are some things, some, what were some of the major shifts that happened in the Enlightenment that we are still dealing with and that are kind of in the air that we breathe today? I think one of the biggest ones is that uh, men became psychologically inclined as opposed to looking at the divine order of things. Okay, yeah, so there was a turn in on the self. Again, we're speaking in very, very broad terms. This will come to you in one second. Very broad terms. Um, and this is generations of history. Um, by and large, up to the 1700s, the Western world was theistic. I mean, you know, just it was everyone was a theist, more or less. Um, exceptions here and there. By and large, the prevailing worldview, you know, in the, I mean, from the early 100s up to 16 or 1700 was generally theist. You know, there was a personal God related to his people. Um, we live in a supernatural world, etc. That was just that was that was understood. Lower, long about the 1700s, that changed. A lot of reasons why that changed. But in 1700s, um, we see in the Enlightenment the exaltation of human reason, the exaltation of man autonomous man, the exaltation of human reason over God's word, a rejection of the supernatural. And that's just not reasonable, is it? I mean, it's not reasonable for a global flood. It's not reasonable for someone to rise from the dead. Have you ever seen someone rise from the dead? I have. Have you ever seen someone? It's not reasonable, is it? And you just take that on and on and on. Um, a, a closed universe kind of worldview. That all there is is matter, motion, time, and chance. A closed universe, rejection of the supernatural. The Bible is not an inspired book, because that would mean that there's a God who interacts and who relates to us and who um, gave his spirit to inspire prophets and apostles who wrote that down. The Bible is just a collection of man's reflection on God. It's a collection of ancient tribes in the ancient Near East, their reflections on God, no different than any other any other religious book. It's one of many religious books. Um, we should study it, and but all that supernatural stuff, there's other explanations. Um, that, that, that entered into, became the predominant worldview, at least in the universities, in the Enlightenment. Um, enlightenment rationalism. Decent, what were you going to what were you going to say? Yeah. Well, say it better than I did. Yeah. What were you going to... What was your thought? Uh, just, I mean, it emphasizes the superiority of human reason. Yeah. Not that possible. Yep, absolutely. Uh, it's like kind of think for yourself. You don't have, you can't, you don't have to um, follow the solid base of mentality that, like, previous centuries. Yep, yep. A rejection of authority. A rejection also of authoritative institutions. So rejection of the church. You know, we don't want some, you know, old archaic, you know, kind of church teaching us about things that aren't really true. We need to break free from old archaic, authoritative institutions, any kind of external authority. You know, man is now the measure of all things. Um, man and his reasoning potential, progress potential, um, optimism. These were all words that kind of were characteristic of the Enlightenment. Uh, yeah. Peter? Yeah, interestingly, the, uh, I was just reading an article about the rebuilding of uh, uh, Notre Dame after the uh, fire. Yep. And, you know, in the French Revolution, they had tore down all evidences of Christianity. Right. An altar to reason. Yep. It looks like they're now going to complete that. Of course, you know, they, we're in postmodern now. That was sort of the. I read that. I saw that same thing. Yeah, beginning of modernism. Yep. Yeah, so the French Revolution was, I mean, a revolution of human autonomy and a bloody, horrific rejection of the church and authority. Um, okay, so that's, that's, that's the, that's, that is, um, that was the shift that came in in 1700 that has been the predominant, prevailing thought in much of the world today. Again, we're thinking broad generalities, um, but just to kind of give us a little bit of the lay of the land. Um, a theistic worldview replaced by a closed universe naturalistic um, worldview. Man is the measure of all things. 
Um, okay, and then in the last 30 or 40 years or so, there's been you know, the rise of other schools of thought for then what's called postmodernism. You ever heard of postmodernism? Postmodernism. Which is more, uh, truth is um, more um, community, community determined. You know, this community, that community, this group, that group. You know, there's certain truth is not objective, but it is, it is determined by a particular interpretive community. A rejection, the famous French scholar um, uh, who, who kind of has a famous definition of postmodernism as um, the rejection of the meta narrative or incredulity towards meta narrative. Meta narrative is an overarching, overarching worldview. The Bible gives us a meta narrative. Creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Right? That's the story, the worldview that we get in the, in the Bible. Um, there is a personal creator who creates sin, enters this world. Um, salvation has come in the gospel in Jesus Christ. History is going somewhere. Um, history is marching towards its, its climactic point in which Jesus will come back. That is a worldview, a meta-narrative. Meta just means big. Narrative is story. So a big story of all of reality. But the postmodernists will say, there's no such thing as a big story that can encompass all people of all time. Each individual community um, interprets truth and reality for themselves. So that's, that's really kind of taking modernism to its logical extreme. Um, if, if human autonomy is, is, um, is, is first, you know, it, it is um, human reasoning powers is ultimate, then each group of reasoning people can determine truth for themselves. Is that by tracking with me at least? These are just some of the, the prevailing worldviews and the prevailing um, systems of thought in the world in which we live. Um, Philip Ryken, uh, he's a professor at Wheaton College now, I wrote a book several years ago called City on a Hill. It's a good book. Um, talking about the church, being the church in, in this world. And he, I think very helpfully, used two words to characterize the fallen world, the sinful fallen world in which we live. Relativism and narcissism. Relativistic and narcissistic. I think, he's, I think that's pretty good. Relativistic towards truth. Again, um, rejection of absolute meta-narrative um, the rejection of objective truth that is true for all time, for all people of anywhere. Um, and then narcissism. Um, we're our own gods. You know, our, our man, the greatest desire of man is to, um, to be good, to feel good, to be happy. Um, our greatest enjoyment. And um, put those two together, um, you get this day and age in which we live. Relativism and narcissism. But, but, Whenever, when I teach a class, um, when I teach a class on pastoral ministry at RTS, and I did, and we would always start, the first lecture was on, let's think about the society in which we live. And I wanted that for two reasons. One is, it's helpful to understand. I mean, it's helpful to understand the times in which we live, but also, not that we can just sit back and say relativistic, you know, relativist, narcissist. No, because this is also the, the culture that we're called to minister to. I mean, we're, we're called to take the gospel to this culture. So it's not just understanding, being able to just kind of, you know, be separate and say, I've got you, I know you better than you know yourself, um, which we actually do, because, you know, we have the Bible, you know, we have the biblical diagnosis. But it's so that we can take the gospel to our neighbor who is blinded in sin and has, and, and is, living in this world with these unbiblical, anti-theistic worldviews. It's, there's, a, there's a positive, constructive purpose. That we can be faithful servants and ambassadors and witnesses, salt and light. That we can shine the light of the gospel in this dark world. And that's always going to be the front and center of what we talk about for the next few weeks. We want to understand the objections, but so that we can better answer them and give them the true answer, which is the gospel, which is the Lord Jesus. Does everybody get that? That's critical. We're going to come back to that again and again and again. Okay. So what are some of the specific um, critiques or questions that we 
face, not, not just kind of describing big world views, but what are some of the actual challenges and objections that we face? Um, if you've read the book, you'll know many of them. But what are some of the things that you might face on the college campus? My nephews and nieces are starting out at college. Um, they're going to hear this uh, in our workplace, uh, books you read, popular culture. What are some of the leading objections, criticisms of Christianity, many of which we'll do with the next few weeks? But let's just think of, think of them and kind of get them out there on the table. Yeah, Brad? If there's a good, all-powerful God, why is there evil in the world? Question of evil and suffering. Absolutely. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time on that one. That's a tough one, and we need to know how to h- handle that one pastorally and intellectually. It depends on who we're talking to, but yes. Um, um, the question of good God, evil, and suffering. Huge question. Yes, Bob? So where I work, it seems the um, prevailing worldview or doctrine that they're pushing is that of inclusion. Yeah. And that seems to uh, filter. So they can say, well, Christianity is not inclusive. Right, right. However, they will have a display case of all the world's religions and their books they like to read. And they have had a Quran that was about that big, and they put a tiny little New Testament next to it. Right. However, they would say, oh, it's okay to be a display. So there's, there's a lot of holes in their theory. We'll get to those. Yeah. yeah. But where, they, where their strength is is that you're just outed. If you say, wait a minute, I have a um, objection. That's, that's where they're intolerant. Right. Yeah, so, um, so the exclusivity of Christian faith, which is just the exclusivity of Jesus himself. Um, I'm going to argue, when we get there, that Christianity, in fact, is the most inclusive religion of them all. And I'll explain what I mean by that uh, when we get there. Every other worldview is vastly exclusive religion. Christianity, what did Jesus say? Come to me, not the rich, not the smart, all of you. We are weary and burdened. That is true inclusiveness. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. Now, those terms, you know, those terms become in Christ in humility and in repentance, but it has come all of you who are weary and burdened. Not just the super smart, you know, not just this or that group. Yeah. Anything else? What other? Yeah, Ethan? A historical accuracy of the Bible. Yes? Like, I got to get this from research on, like, the, the school and stuff, and apparently, like, they have no evidence in Egyptian history that. Right, yeah, so uh, historical challenges to the Bible. Um, yeah, so just challenges, a lot of challenges to the Bible itself. I mean, is the Bible, um, is it really accurate? Um, we claim it's, it's inerrant. Um, Jesus thought it was inerrant. Um, um, are there contradictions in the Bible? And how do you have the, you know, what if the scribe messed up? You know, what if the scribe messed up and, and, and the, preserving the, the text throughout 2,000 years, how do you get the right word? Um, good question. So we'll talk about that. There are answers. None of these, let's say, none of these objections are things the church never thought about. I mean, we have 2,000 years of the church thinking and wrestling and coming up, in our, not coming up with and, and articulating good, biblical, faithful answers. I mean, none of this is new. There's nothing new under the sun. They're reading Ecclesiastes. Um, yes, Angela? I think it's difficult when they they don't accept Christianity, but they also don't have any objections. They're like, well, that's nice for you, but my truth is from somewhere else. Right. You know? Yeah, that, that's going to be something very difficult. Yeah, kind of apathy, just a general um, apathy, which I found is actually more prevalent you know, today. Right. It's a general kind of malaise and, and um, apathetic attitude. Right. Well, there's this, this idea, you know, I believe the sky is green, Anything else? Yes. Yeah. The I'm okay, you're okay, and that's exactly what I think she was saying. Yeah. The, that the, mentality, I'm okay, you're okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm yeah. okay, you're okay, yeah. we're all okay. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. There's no sin, you know. We're yeah. basically good. Yeah. Jennifer? Uh, reconciling oh. the God of the Old Testament and Christ. And yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah, the God who opens in the flood did something out of the New Testament. Yeah. Jennifer, you have a thought back in the back? Yeah. yeah, the relationship between Christianity and Absolutely. Yep. Yep. How does the church relate to um, political 
institutions, and then you had uh, Constantine way back in the 300s, and you know, that that changed with founding America, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so that's a, a big one um, as well. Um, let me just give you. Oh, I got. Okay, go ahead, John. Well, I, I, it kind of goes in line with the Enlightenment in the Old Testament. My sister would say, "How can you, as a rational person, accept the Bible as true?" Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that one of the biggest damaging things is the uh, inconsistency of the way his followers yes. have treated others. Very good. Yep. I, I think that's the, the heart of many, many unbelieving hearts. Yep, it is. You know, um, yep, Arthur Sproul, um, come back to you know, his, he would say, you know, uh, the church is full of hypocrites, that, that objection. Um, and it is, um, exactly. Um, um, so yeah, I mean the inconsistency of those who take the name of Jesus on their lips with living out the faith. Absolutely. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I mean the science right now. Science. So that, that's a big thing. People yeah, we'll get that as a science that's the Bible. Yeah. And then they got Copernicus and all that stuff. Um, okay, so I, I can't guarantee you what we'll get to all of those questions. Um, but we'll hit some of the big ones. And so I think we've got all the ones I had down. Um, is, isn't Christianity immoral? Um, the God of the Old Testament mean and cruel? Exclusivity of Christ? The reality of hell? How can a good guy allow suffering? And, um, the Bible's view of homosexuality and sexual ethics? As in science disproves the Bible? Et cetera, et cetera. So those are things, that, those are kind of things we will think about and, um, you know, kind of uh, get tools in our toolbox um, for answering those kind of questions. Um, that, that are out there, and uh, we need to know how to answer them. Okay, so let's move on to point two. Let's see, look at a few um, um, Bible verses. We're actually get into them, these questions, next week. Um, we'll kind of dip our foot in next week. Next week, we're going to talk about the idea of a worldview. Um, very important. Um, what does it mean to have a Christian worldview? And as we dialogue with others who have opposing you know, challenges and, and, and questions, we want to think about the Christian worldview versus those to whom we're talking, their worldview. A clash of, a clash of worldviews. Um, so we'll talk about what a worldview is, what are some verses that talk about that. So that's where we're going to go next week. Um, but some foundation of biblical text. I'm going to have a few folks read some verses. Can someone look up 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? Mm. Someone else look up John 17, 17. Matthew chapter 4, 1 Peter 3.15, and we'll stop right there. So, we are going to begin all of our discussions, all of our thoughts. We have a starting place, and that starting place is the authority of God's word. That's where we begin. That's our, our foundation is the Bible is God's word given to us. Now, we'll talk about objections to the Bible later. I'll come towards the end of the class. But at root foundation, we begin with our authority is the authority of the Bible because every question, every objection eventually boils down to competing authorities. What is your authority? Our authority is the Bible. What does the Bible say about X? What does the Bible say about itself? Um, what does the Bible say about hell, about sexuality? What does the Bible say about truth? Um, what does the Bible say about who God is? You know, all kind of, all kind of stuff. Um, that's where we begin, and there's a lot of verses that that um, ground our our worldview and our um, the authority of the Bible. So, Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen. Can someone read? Someone read that. Do you have it? Okay, so this is a key verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So foundational 316, you know, we love John 316, we equally love 2 Timothy 316. Um, all scripture is God breathed. The Greek word is theopneustos, breathed out by God. Some of the translations might have inspired. Um, 
kind of the best translation? All scripture is God breathed, is breathed out. You know, when we speak, we our breath comes from us. It's a bit cold. Um, go outside in the morning and, and you can see your breath. You know, so that is what the Bible is. The Bible is God's breath. It is his word. He is the ultimate author. He is the divine author. So everything in the Bible bucket is inspired, breathed out by God, and as such is our ultimate standard. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. Can someone else read, Jim, if you've got it, can you read 1 Timothy 5.18? Now, someone might come up to you and say, what, what, what did Paul have in mind when he wrote that? What, what, kind of, what scriptures did Paul specifically have in mind when he wrote that? The Old Testament, right? So someone might say, isn't that verse just talking about the Old Testament? You know, the Old Testament is God breathed. And we would say, yes, it is, but it's also talking about the New Testament as well. How do you know that? Well, a couple thoughts. The word there for scripture is the word grape, G R A P H E. Graph. We can use graph. It's graph. Um, so all grape, a technical word in the Bible is God breathed. So everything that is in the grape bucket. So here we have this is a bucket. This is grape is scripture. And what does Paul say? All scripture is what? Is breathed out by God. Breathed by God. So anything in here is breathed out by God. There are other places, a couple others we'll look at, in the New Testament that use the same word, grape, and that are very important. So, Jim, do you have 1 Timothy? Can you read 1 Timothy 5, 18? 1 Timothy 5, 18. And I want you to listen to what Paul does in 1 Timothy 5, 18. And listen very carefully. Okay, can you do that? For the scripture says... Stop. Okay, for the scripture says, right? The scripture says, here's the graphic, right? Mm -hmm. The graphic says, now listen to what Paul quotes from. Okay, go ahead. You shall not muzzle an ox while it tries to drain. Stop there. Let me know where that verse is from. Deuteronomy. So Paul says, all scriptures God breathes, the scripture says, and he quotes from Deuteronomy. So we'll put Deuteronomy and the the whole Old Testament goes in the bucket. It's all of God breathed. And where, where do you quote from next? And the laborer is worthy of his wages. Where's that from? I have a footnote. It tells you. Jim is punching something. I've got to get the right symbol. Uh, Leviticus 19.13. Deuteronomy 20. And Luke. So it's also, yeah, from Luke. Um, Luke chapter 10. So um, so there, Paul says, the scripture says, and then he quotes from Deuteronomy and from one of the Gospels. Um, Paul's just assuming that the Gospel, simply the Gospel of Luke, and by deduction, you know, all four Gospels, um, are graphe. They are all scripture. And as such, they're all breathed out by God. So the New Testament authors, this is the key, the New Testament authors assume that the New Testament books are Scripture, that they are on par, have the same authority as the Old Testament. Paul can quote from Deuteronomy, and he can quote from Luke, and say both of them are Scripture, they're both God-breathed. Did I get that? He doesn't say the Old Testament has a little more authority. I don't know. Paul says Luke... Luke is just as authoritative, just as breathed out as is um, as is uh, Deuteronomy Old Testament. One other key verse: Second Peter three sixteen. Anybody have Second Peter three sixteen? Here Peter's talking. Someone has it. Go ahead and read it read slowly, and listen to what Peter does. Any volunteers? John, you got it? Second Peter 3.16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, 
in which are some things hard to understand. Okay, back to start to verse 15. Sorry. <laughs> Consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So there's that word. So as they do the rest of the scriptures. Let me reread this real quick. So here, the Apostle Peter is talking, and he says, <coughs> Peter says, Count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Just as our beloved brother Paul, here Peter's talking about Paul here, also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, so here Peter's talking about Paul's letters, which is the bulk of the New Testament, when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. So Peter's saying, you know, there's some things in Paul that are hard to understand. Um, so we'd agree with it. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So here, Peter is placing Paul's letters on par with the other scriptures, with the other graphic. That's not even his main point. Now, Peter's main point is not to, to teach us their you know, a doctrine of the scriptures. Peter just assumes and states that Paul's writings, some of them are hard to understand. Some people twist Paul's writings, so you've got to be careful, like they twist the other scriptures. It just kind of flows. He didn't hit a stop and say, and from that you need to learn that you know Paul's work, Paul's letters are authoritative. But Peter just assumes Paul's letters are scripture. So we put Paul's letters into the Graphe bucket. We can do that more and more. So the point is, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture as God breathed includes all of your Bible, both the Old and the New Testament. The New Testament authors assume that their writings are under the inspiration of the Spirit and are equally authoritative as the Old Testament and are the breathed out word of God. Hold that thought just for one second. So a couple other verses real quick. Uh, John 17, 17. Anyone have John 17, 17? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus says, thy word is truth. Truth there is a noun. So thy word is, it's, he doesn't say thy word is true, which could, one might say, that means the Bible conforms to some higher standard of truth. It's true, insofar as it conforms to something else. No, the Bible is truth itself. The Bible is, God's word is, the highest standard of truth. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth. Right? John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth. Jesus also says, thy word is truth. The Bible is the standard itself. The, the determiner of what is true is not human reason, but it is the Bible is what God says, the breathed out scriptures. Okay, a um, couple more. Uh, John 10, 35. You want to read John 10, 35 real quick? John 10, 35. If you've got it, go ahead and, and read it. Up there. So Jesus says the scriptures cannot be broken. And there Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees um, about Jesus' claim to be God. And Jesus quotes from one of the Psalms, Psalm 82, verse 6. And Jesus bases his argument against the Pharisees on one word in Psalm 82, 6. And he says the scriptures cannot be broken. What that, and it means the scriptures cannot be nullified. The scriptures cannot be proven to be false. The scriptures are truth. Therefore, they can never be broken. They can never be nullified. They can never, ever, ever, ever be shown to be false. As they are the word of the God who is truth itself. 
through the breathed out word of the God who is truth. Jesus believed in inerrancy. We want our view of the Bible to be consistent with Jesus' view of the Bible. I want to believe about the Bible what Jesus believed about the Bible. Jesus believed the Bible was the truth, cannot be broken, as it is the breathed out word of God. Um, Matthew chapter 4, um, we don't need to read it. In Matthew 4, Jesus is facing uh, Satan in the wilderness. And to where, to what does Jesus, where does he go as he answers Satan's temptations? It is written. It is written, it is written, it is written. Jesus, as he is doing battle with the evil one in the wilderness, he goes to the Bible. It is written, and that settles the case. It is written, it is written, it is written. Okay, two more verses we'll read, and then we will um, we'll wrap up. So 1 Peter 3.15, this is kind of the, the, the classic verse on apologetics, on having an answer to, to those who ask us questions. Two things I want you to get in this verse. 1 Peter 3.15, Peter says, In your hearts, honor Christ as Lord, always being prepared to make a defense, the word apologia, make an apologetic a defense, to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Three things. We are commanded to be ready to give an answer. Point number one. Point number two. What is it that Peter says we're to give an answer for? For the what that is in you. He could have said a lot of things. But he says, when those who ask you for a reason for the hope that is in you. That assumes that we are a hopeful people. That our lives are characterized by hope and by joy and by peace, by our relationship with Christ, the peace that the world cannot give. Jesus says, my peace I give to you, not that the world gives, but I give it to you. Peter uses their hope and equates it with the gospel. So we are to, our, our lives are to bear witness to our profession. Kind of goes with what um, Chris was saying earlier. Our lives are to be marked by a certain hope and peace and joy that will cause others to say, you know, there's something different about those folks. Why? You know, if we live in a, a world so full of anger and hatred and division, how can you have hope? Peter says we need to be ready to give an answer for that. And then thirdly, and we'll come back to this again, how do we do that? He says with gentleness and respect. Not just what we say, it's also how we say it. And so our goal is um, to, to win them to Christ, a biblical worldview. Um, so we want to demonstrate the character of Christ as we set forth the truth of Christ. To always be ready, to give an answer for the hope that is to mark our lives, our, our relationships at home and at work, with gentleness and respect. Um, so Peter... Um, you know, calls us uh, how, how we engage. It's important, yeah, Peter. Well, I, I'm, I don't mean to throw a monkey wrench into anything here, and then you're talking about the content of his authority in this worldview, and right. I know that worldview is coming later, but the basis on which you are doing it presumes a certain coherence, a certain logic. That right. I'm thinking of uh, R.C. Sproul and Derek Derrick's book, Classical Apologetics. Right. Where the acts of the mind are to, to apprehend meaning, to judge truth right. or, or, or falsity, and then to reason. But mm -hmm. but don't we have to go even to a lower level today with a with a world that almost rejects the unconsciously rejects the very framework with which we're looking at these different concepts? Um, uh, short answer, and I'll run you over. Yes, we do, and we will we'll get to that as we walk through the book. Um, and that's the whole point of kind of next next week, we're going to talk a little about worldviews. And, and we will, one of the things we can do as we engage with our, our friends, our unbelieving friends, is, is talk to them about their own worldview. And can you, are you really living consistently? Can you actually live consistently with what you're claiming? And they can't. 
Right. I mean, th- th- there's no way. It's impossible because they are God's image bearers in God's world. Um, and so we can use that to, to find, you know, um, you know, common places to begin that dialogue. The, the common ground is image bearers. No one can reject the fact that they are an image bearer of God. And that brings with it certain things that are inescapable. Um, Romans 1, we'll talk about next week, has a lot to say about that. And so, yeah, the short answer is yes, you're right. And we'll, right, we'll and, talk the, about and that. the debate really, you, you shouldn't be debating things that are trying to apprehend meaning. So much of this is going to boil down to defining what words mean. True, yep, yep. All right, Lee, real quick. I'm just going to, you know, say what you just said about the image bearers. That's the one thing that we have in common, even if yep. just on... Uh, narcissistic world, most of the people that you talk to are going to say, what's in it for me? Right. But then when you go to, we're all image bearers of God, I think that is the connection that is irrefutable. That is the key common ground, is that we are all image bearers. As Paul said in Romans 1, that is an inescapable reality. No matter how much they deny it, it's it's true. Because the Bible says it's true. Um, and so that, that's where we can go. You know, we, we talk to fellow image bearers who do know God, even though they suppress it. Paul says they do know God. So we'll go from that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this, just this introduction. Father, I pray that we would, uh, you would help us to equip us by the Spirit to engage those, our, our family members, um, our friends, those that we care for deeply, to engage them with truth, but to do so with gentleness and respect, that at the end of the day, Jesus is the answer to the longing of the heart, to the despair, to the hopelessness of the world in which we live. Father, may we be ready to give an answer for the hope that marks us, the hope of Christ. Be with us the rest of the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll start next week. Moving forward.